Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, especially to Isabel that uh, knows us from a long time ago, and she is a great believer in open data soft, and she, she invited us to present here. So I'm proudly representing Open Data Soft. Um, we are, well, I'm going to talk to you about some impacts of uh, open data from our experience, what we have seen, and how can we uh, see that our clients are able to boost open innovation through uh, sharing their data. So basically, what I'm going to go through is um, give an intro, a, big, a quick intro of who we are. Um, secondly, the actors that we identify that are interested in opening data. And these actors may have different incentives to do so. Um, some myths in reality, because there's a lot of expectations of open data, a lot of studies that I have said that uh, there will be millions of euros created from the open data environment and from the release of data, a lot of jobs. Um, and sometimes people ask themselves whether this is or how this is advancing. So some myths and realities that we see. Uh, and then some real use cases from what we see, what our clients do. So first, who we are. We are a European open data software provider. And not only open data, it started as a software for open data, but we also do private data sharing. So I oftentimes say that we should be called data sharing software. Um, but uh, we're open data soft, that's our name. Uh, but it can be public and private. And basically what it does is um, you upload a data set in different formats. The platform normalizes it, and then it transforms it into APIs. Um, we also have visualizations. So I'll show you just a, a couple of examples. But our, the, the functionality that we're the most proud of is the API. And just as a disclaimer, I don't come from the tech world. I come from public policy, activism, anti-corruption. That's why I ended up in open government, open data. Um, but the API is a functionality that makes us the most proud. And then the, what is the platform going to have? It's going to basically have, for those of you who are familiarized with an open data portal, you have a catalog. So you have your library of uh, what data sets you have. You can sort by theme, by keyword, by publisher, um, when it was published, etc. And then you, we also have visualizations. So you can create graphs, dashboards within the data set or in content pages, um, maps that you can, depending on the type of data, um, it might be better to put them on clusters or on heat maps. Uh, so we have different types of maps. And then what brings me here, the API. Um, we, we are a French company, so uh, we are a European company. We have offices in Paris. We have offices in London and Boston. Um, we have clients in 19 countries, and the platform is uh, translated into 10 uh, different languages. And uh, these clients can be Typically, what we hear about open data, governments. So yes, we have a lot of governments, a lot of cities, a lot of ministries. Uh, but it's only 50% of our clients. The rest are companies, um, typically as well in the smart city ecosystem, so energy, transportation. But we also have banks, insurances, retail. Um, and we have identified. Uh, so as I said earlier, our software was born as an open data software. But uh, throughout these years, from 2011 until now, we have identified different types of usages that our clients do with our same platforms, the same product for everybody. But we have identified four uses. So open data, then private data, uh, smart cities, so a lot of sensoring data, cameras that push uh, images every two seconds, uh, or water um, um, meters, uh, sensors, um, and creating a product. So there's a lot of our clients that have another core business, and they're not going to take the time to create a software to make this data available to their clients, partners, whoever. So they use our platform to make this data available. So 
With regards to the actors and the incentives that we see to open data, uh, the theory, it would say that a lot of organizations should have the same interest. Yeah, there is a common interest, which is to have visibility, to build trust uh, within your ecosystem, if you're a government, probably with your citizens. Um, but in the actors that we see, which are governments, the smart city actors, uh, companies, typically governments are going to want to engage the community, engage the citizens into um, the information that they're publishing through transparency and access to information. Uh, smart city actors are going to want to improve performance, so deliver a public service if you're a concessionary, um, de deliver a public service in a better way with a l lower cost. And the companies, they're going to want, so we have several cases, some of them want to improve performance, and some of them are looking at this through the corporate social responsibility. So, uh, a little bit like cleaning their image by sharing information about maybe uh, some of them are, are publishing information about um, uh, where they're producing and their impact, their environmental impact of their products. In, the, in reality, um, we have to keep in mind that opening data must give a return of investment to whatever publisher that decides to open this information. So for governments, it's going to be a lot of a political um, return of investment, either having their citizens happy, either uh, differentiating themselves from a competitor political party. Uh, in the smart city business, it's going to be to deliver the services in a timely manner, but to save money. And for companies, to cut costs. That's what they're looking for, or improve their benefits. Um, there are some problems that we see for, of course, we want more organizations to be publishing data and we try to convince them. Uh, but we see, because we operate in different countries, we see differences that, and that sometimes can operate as blockages. So first one is legislation. There's, as Gianfranco was uh, presenting yesterday, and some other people from the European Commission, there's different directives, especially in Europe, that are pushing national governments to open more data. Um, but the problem might be as well that there's no sanction. So yes, there's a push, but if I don't have a sanction and I don't have the political incentive, I might never do it. Uh, then another blockage is the form of contracting. Um, sometimes the way that budgets are uh, given uh, block the um, procurement, let's say, possibilities. So even though a government might be very interested to buy and to put this uh, very advanced, uh, somebody was telling me yesterday, uh, very advanced solution, um, sometimes their budgeting and allocation does not allow them to do that. And then in the private sector, I have seen this a lot. Um, in France, there was a law that passed in 2016 that even though it didn't have any sanctions, so it's an imperfect law, but it was pushing uh, companies that have public interest data, so you would think of energy transportation, uh, to start opening data. And so in France, there, was, uh, there is an ecosystem that is pushing themselves, and they're seeing their competition that is opening a portal, and so they cannot fall behind. And I'm in charge of the uh, Ibero-American region, uh, and I would come to Spain and I would talk to energy companies and they would be like, why in the world would I open data from my company? So a lot of times, if there's no other competitors of yours that are doing this and that are taking a step forward, then you don't have the incentive as a private sector um, to move. Uh, going to the myths and the realities. So we have seen um, and we're very proud of our software and that people like it a lot and we keep trying to improve it all the time, but we've seen a lot of people that think that because they open a portal with us, then innovation will be automatically boosted or will arrive somehow. Um, that the data will be reused, that it will attract the, the reusers, and for governments that citizens are just going to be happy and they're going to trust us more. Well, eventually we would like this to be the case, 
But even though we love our software, technology is not enough. So you cannot think that by just opening a super, uh, I call it the Boeing 787 um, open data software, that is not enough if you don't put quality data in, if you don't ask the community what they're looking for. Um, maybe you're spending 80% of your efforts in publishing budget data and how the government is spending the public money, which is super important. As an activist, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, but maybe the citizens are more interested in transportation data. Or me, if I'm an environmental activist, I'm interested to see where uh, there's shared gardens, where I can plant things because I live in an apartment, uh, or the, uh, the cultural activities in the city. So maybe just you need to make a bigger effort to get in contact with that data community to see what data they're interested in. Um, so that is uh, a little bit going towards the demand-driven open data strategy. Um, then also thinking about quality and quantity. We see a lot of governments that say, well, I have a thousand open data, uh, data sets or I have uh, 10,000, and that's great. But um, once I heard in a conference that instead of 1,000, it would be maybe better to have 100 that you're really sure that people are interested in and that they're going to reuse. Um, then something that is often said as well for open data strategies is that um, it's very useful to have a project in mind and have a problem. So different cities, we're always going to want to have uh, transparency in uh, budget allocation and expenditure, but different cities have different characteristics and different problems. In Mexico City, for example, there's a lot of earthquakes, there's a lot of uh, buildings, and the former government didn't open anything. There was a big, big earthquake almost exactly two years ago, and everybody was demanding, like, how did these permissions to construct in this area were were given, that means corruption, etc. So the new government is opening a lot of the risk atlas um, and a lot of these permits uh, through an open data portal with us. Um, and then lastly, uh, it has been said a lot in the conferences here, it is very important to build an ecosystem. So um, to, for example, organize hackathons. I know that hackathons are not going to give the solutions to the world, but it boosts an ecosystem, the datathons, hackathons, mapathons. So going to the use cases, remembering that we have public, private, smart cities. Um, here are some of the logos of uh, some of our clients, cities, ministries, energy companies, transportation, construction, uh, luxury, telcos. I'm going to tell you about five cases of reuse of data through APIs. Uh, so the first one was actually presented yesterday uh, by the French Ministry of Agriculture. So they started publishing the hygiene inspections to restaurants or any um, store that has food. And basically through the software that transforms again the data into APIs, uh, some of the applications that citizens uh, already use, such as Yelp, TripAdvisor, etc., would be able to branch uh, the results of the hygiene inspections to that other app that is already being used. They created an app that is called Alim Confiance, um, but eventually through the API, through the open API, anybody would be able to reuse. Uh, the next one is a very typical case. Uh, I know that it's very uh, oftentimes mentioned, but we have cases like this. Where's my bus? They, um, they uh, open the, the real-time localization of the buses, and there is an application for the citizens. The next one is quite interesting. It's in Toulouse, and it is, um, they open the information about the school lunches in kindergarten and elementary schools. And um, so parents are able to see what their kids are going to have for lunch tomorrow, where that uh, food is coming from. And imagining my kid would have uh, an allergy, I would be able to send him or her um, to school with a different lunch for the next day. So that's something for everyday life. The next one, as a non-French, is very funny for me. It's called uh, Miss Pipi app. So 
Uh, as I said, every city has a very different problematic. Paris is a beautiful city. I live there. I love it. Uh, but as a foreigner, you arrive as a tourist, and there's a particular smell in the metro or especially near the beautiful river. Um, and the government has tried to tackle this, and they have put a lot of uh, public toilets. Um, so, well, they opened the data about all of the public toilets, and there is an app that can show you if you have, you know, the need. It can show you the quickest uh, public toilet where you can get, and even if uh, it's also available for handicapped, etc. And last one that uh, probably Isabel is going to like is uh, Archive de la Planète. So it's a it's a museum uh, near Paris and. The, well, the platform also allows you to upload uh, images, so if your data set has it. So what they did is they published all of the collection of the museum of uh, photographies. So you can, in the filter, in the map, you can sort by region of the world, because all these pictures were taken all around the world. So you can choose by time, by region, etc. And uh, it will show you the, the photographies. So this is great because you can share knowledge easily through open data. Somebody that might not maybe have the economic resources to ever go to Paris to go to this museum will be able to have access to the collection. So the conclusions. Um, also, as Gianfranco was saying yesterday, uh, open data is difficult to measure uh, the, the real economic impact or transformed into money because you also need uh, by principle, open data and the open government movement means proactive transparency. It means that you should not ask uh, the citizens to register themselves into the open data portal in order to make the data available. That's kind of against the principle of the open government, open data movement. So you depend on the reusers to tell you what data they like, what data they would like to be open, and what the, re the reuses are. So through the platform, you can have some kind of idea because we have analytics in the back office which tell you like where people are logging, but you don't know who it is um, if the people don't want to register directly. Um, but so in general terms, what we see uh, and with the cases that I showed is that in the social uh, uh, sphere, it can build trust through transparency and access to information. Um, you can deliver better services um, for public and private sector. Uh, for citizens, they can make better decisions for their everyday life because if the data about the localizations of the buses is from two hours ago, it doesn't serve any purpose for me. I need to take a decision right now if the bus is late, whether I take a taxi, a bike, or I walk. Um, so this is kind of uh, the impact for an everyday life, the lunch, um, the consumption, if I can know, uh, I don't know, I, I was telling yesterday at the dinner that there's, it's been a long time since I buy clothes because I have this um, bad feeling like what if this company is hiring children or uh, tearing down trees and I don't want to be a part of that. So if companies would do that more um, and, and be transparent about their, uh, th this kind of data, then consumers would be empowered to, be take, to take everyday decisions. Um, sharing knowledge, the cultural uh, case that I showed you. And the economic part, well, savings in uh, improving performance, savings in money and in time, that is very valuable, and the better delivery of services. And just as a wrap-up, technology is very important. We love it, but it doesn't solve your whole, your whole problem if you don't put quality data, if you don't boost your ecosystem, if you don't have a clear project, roadmap, and a vision. It can change over time, but it's good to start with an idea. Um, and it would be great to have more legislation. Um, we don't want a big burden, but Yes, something that boosts that sparkle for maybe some companies or some governments that don't feel it right now. Um, and to strengthen the ecosystem so that 
a lot of people in their own silo, their own government, they might feel very alone because they want to do it, but they don't know what other use cases, they don't know other people who have done it. So if we build this ecosystem, we might empower them to be able to take that step and to try, experiment, and learn from that. So I will make the, well, the, the presentation is available on that link. And after this, there are a lot of uh, individual use cases by client that if you're interested, you can, you can take a look or you can write me an email. We can have a call or we can mingle at the coffee break. Um, so I'd be happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you. <laughs>